Alrighty, well, hello everyone. Hey, thanks so much for tuning into this video. I am uh, honored to be here and hanging out with Abraham Aranger. And, and forgive me, we were we were just laughing before we started recording. Like, man, I know I'm gonna butcher the last name, but thanks so much, Abraham. It's great to have you here with us. Uh, you're over at Seven A Security, I hear. The CEO, managing director, doing some awesome stuff with Seven A Security and pen testing and training. Uh, I'd love to hear, hey, what you're up to these days and what you're all about, my friend. Yeah, uh, well, 70 Security is a security company. We do uh, penetration testing of uh, mobile applications, web security, uh, cloud security as well, and, you know, some network perimeter uh, stuff security. Uh, we also do phishing, uh, <laughs> if somebody's interested in that. But, but yeah, those are some of the things we do. And on the training side, we have delivered security training at Black Hat USA and many of the other uh, well-known uh, security conferences uh, in the world. Awesome. I have uh, I've not been able to make it out to any Black Hat training, but I would absolutely love to. Um, are you guys doing that anytime soon? Is there more coming up in person? Or how can I ask how frequent is the pen testing versus how frequent is the training? Well, uh, pen testing is pretty much every week. There's like some tests going on. But uh, but yeah, training, uh, it depends, right? Is uh, whenever the conferences are ready. Sometimes we also do uh, private training for companies. Uh, and we also have like a, a store in case uh, anybody's interested in just the, getting the online materials, you know, and then we have like a training portal with all the video recording, the slides, all the vulnerable apps and stuff. So people can also go like to store.70security.com and get all the courses from there. Awesome. Awesome. I, I, I'm super grateful that you kind of have some of the vulnerable applications and like what you use for the exercises also available because that's the toughest thing. I feel like, hey, when you when you have the recording of some course or class or training, uh, you still want to have like the labs and the exercises and the books along with it. So uh, yeah. thanks so much for doing that. <laughs> what what yeah, are so, you? So, uh, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. No, no. Well, sometimes uh, we, we, we had like some people because the training is very heavily hands-on and sometimes we had like, this is very rare, but we got uh, 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 some, some student from uh, some government uh, <laughs> mm. <laughs> that was not really like willing to do like uh, manual exercises. I was expecting like the trainer to be like all the time, like, like sp speaking and stuff. And, and uh. you know, because it's so hands-on sometimes, uh, Occasionally, there's people that uh, that prefer training more to be like the all the slides and the trainer speaking all the time, but their training is like very heavy, heavily like hands-on. Like there's like one hour uh, lab, and then maybe the trainer speaks like for 15 minutes, and then the rest of the hour where while people are doing exercises, we are just helping the student. And and yeah, and another twist is that, for example, in the mobile course, there's some interesting apps like from government agencies and, <laughs> and apps that were mandated in countries like in South Korea, for example, there was a, an application called Smart Sheriff that was mandated in the entire country. Oh, so wow. by law, every parent and child was forced to install this application. And it was so bad that we even gave a talk about it. <laughs> hmm. So if you search on YouTube for Smart Sheriff Dumb Idea, uh, it will show you like the full talk and uh, and yeah, it was so bad that we even use it in the mobile course, right? Just to demonstrate like uh, all the security mistakes and stuff. So for for some exercises for man in the middle and other things like what you should never do in a mobile application, we use like some real applications like that. So, wow. <laughs> so that's um, <laughs> some fun. Like it's not just like dummy apps, like it's all like based uh, on, on real uh, vulnerabilities found in real pen tests. And what we are going to be talking about today, which is Electron, even though it's a dummy application, all the vulnerabilities that we use in the workshop and in the real course are from real pen tests, but uh, adapted, you know, like dumb it down a little bit uh, to protect the guilty, right? Nice. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> I remember you mentioned uh, you have the mobile course. Uh, are there others or kind of what else, what other sort of topics and subjects are in your catalog, if I may? Yeah, as of right now, we have like a mobile course. Uh, then we have like the web security course, which is more about like uh, Node.js, but we also cover a bit of PHP, Python, and I think some Java. Nice. And then uh, and then there's the Electron uh, course, which is about desktop security, but mostly about uh, desktop applications written in JavaScript, like uh, using Electron, which is a bit of what we're going to be touching on today. 
Awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much. I know we're, we're getting into it. Uh, you had, uh, you, you have some of these courses coming up. Is that right? I remember you told me, Hey, February 24th. Uh, and then is there another yeah. one in March? Which, what's going on? Yeah, this, we try to do two workshops every month, which are completely free. So everybody can go to seven secure comes last training. If you want to join live, uh, or you can also go to Seven Secure Comms last free and just uh, get the recording, the slides, and all the vulnerable apps if you cannot like making at that time. Um, but but yeah, we also deliver. We have like some uh, courses coming up. For example, for Forty Four Con in March, uh, we are also accepted to Nulcon, which will be online. Uh, this is in May, and then there's also NorthSec. I think it's also in May. Nice, yeah. Uh, and yeah, and there's uh, probably others coming up. Like you know, it's always uh, a dynamic thing. Yeah, there's always <laughs> some conference or event or something new coming up. But yeah. awesome, cool. Uh, well, hey, I think this has been enough uh, setting the stage. And I think I don't know. Would you like to dive into maybe some cool sneak peek, a little bit of a teaser, a little bit of a showcase as to sure. what students could get their hands on coming into this course here in this training? Sure. Uh, if you want, I can start sharing my slides and Absolutely. then I can introduce the topic and then we can, uh, you know, go into this. So in case anybody wants to like download the uh, vulnerable app that I'm going to show today or you cannot make it like to the full workshop, you can get all of free workshops from here. Just seven secure comes last free. So this is um, for this particular workshop about uh, electron security. There's like a full like one hour and a half recording, uh, and then you have you get the full slides and all the vulnerable apps uh, and the slides and everything for free. So, so yeah, today we will be talking about uh, electron context isolation and remote code execution, right? So uh, we touched a little bit uh, briefly on this. So I'm basically Abraham Aranguren. So this is the question I get at every security conference: How do you pronounce your surname? So uh, the Spanish way is Aranguren, but uh, you know, uh, I'm fine. Whatever. That I like close. the German, <laughs> the German, uh, the German variant uh, that I heard uh, once when I was in Germany was Aranguren, and I really, I really yeah. like that. It sounds really cool. So the the German variant is my favorite, but uh, you know, you can try. So <laughs> whatever you you try is fine. So in the sea of seventy security, uh, we do uh, penetration testing, we do security training, and you can. Uh, Sometimes uh, it's maybe not emphasized enough that uh, a very good way to learn about security for free is to read public pen test reports. So we are one of those few companies that uh, sometimes publish uh, pen test reports. So if you go to Service Secure Comes Last Publications, nice. you can see, uh, for example, the, the two uh, Smart Sheriff reports are, are there among other uh, public pen test reports. So. <laughs> Uh, I'm co-author of all the seven security courses, so the mobile, the web, and the desktop uh, application security courses. So if you're interested in that, you can go to seven secure comes last training. And yeah, we have delivered security training at Black Hat USA, Hacking the Box, was Global AppSec, LastCon, 44 Con, HackFest, NullCon, Sec, TD, like and many others. Um, I've done stuff for Q53 and version one. Also for eLearn security, I, I worked at course uh, in, about practical web called practical web defense about uh, hacking and defending web applications i'm the founder and one of the project leaders of OWASP OWTF so this is a completely free and open source project if you type OWTF.org in your browser that will take you to the project page and this is my slideshare and then i always uh, make fun of this like um, uh, I was a developer first and then I switched to security. So uh, if you are a pen tester or if you are a, a developer, I, I got you covered. I, I know what you feel. Uh, I know the deadlines of developers. I know the frustration of pen testers. So I know both sides and, and I only have like friends at either side, right? So uh, yeah, so with that, uh, maybe I can start uh, introducing the topic. Totally. So. Today, we will be talking about uh, electron context isolation and remote code execution. In particular, we will be attacking preload scripts, right? Because in the course, we also talk about other scenarios. When, when you don't have context isolation, it's also possible to use another technique, for example, that sends uh, um, an IPC to electron itself, and then you can gain code execution that way by attacking electron itself, regardless of uh, what the application does on the preload script, but uh, maybe if to keep things a little bit simpler, we will be just attacking preload scripts today, which is also very cool. So this application uh, is available for free. So if you go to 70 slash free, 
and you download the workshop, then you click on the slides. And from the slides, you can just click on this and it will download just fine. If you try to W get this, it won't work. But if you click from the slides uh, after you like uh, register and everything, it will download just fine. So I'm just mentioning this because sometimes people uh, are confused. So, okay, now a question before we jump into uh, what this is, is uh, why would you run a JavaScript application in your desktop computer? Like, like is this crazy? Like, who is doing this? What What is the reason for this, right? So uh, a lot of people, uh, especially security people, are kind of uh, saying, like, this is crazy. Like, you should never do this. Why would you do this, right? So the reason is that normally... Uh, People, like when you have a desktop application, you need to hit the, the three major platforms, right? So you need to hit Windows, Linux, and Mac, because those are the, you know, the major platforms still today. So uh, historically, you would have to pay Windows developers, Linux developers, and Mac developers. So this is expensive because you have three development departments. Uh, they are different people, different skills. Uh, it basically costs more money, right? So now... Using Electron applications, you only need to pay JavaScript developers. So you have a single uh, development uh, team. Uh, probably you have to pay a lot less developers. Uh, and, and yeah, you have to pay only uh, JavaScript developers. And now the application magically works on everything. It works on Windows, Linux, and Mac, but you only have to pay JavaScript developers. right? So this is what makes uh, Electron very interesting for companies. And then the next question that probably is in everybody's mind, like who is really using this uh there's really a lot right so there's like uh, skype microsoft teams uh, zoom slack discord bitgarden uh, gitlab signal uh, streamlabs uh, uh, wordpress for desktop whatsapp desktop i mean the list is endless and, and there's a lot of well-known apps in this slide right so i always so think really of uh discord and slack as like the number ones that jump out of my head but it's it's crazy yeah. that that is an ever-growing list because it, it's cross-platform <laughs> yeah that's it that's it yeah and uh, it's it's very cool but at the same time uh, if the developers are not uh, aware of the risks uh, there can be like some interesting vulnerability so it's what we will be talking about today right so when you click on the slack application right that you mentioned so you let's say you click on the slack application let's pretend this is the icon to launch it so you click on this and then the first thing that is created inside of the application is the main process and then for each window that the electron app uh, displays there's going to be a different uh, render process right so one uh, window that the user sees, one render process, right? So an application can have several. Normally, it's only going to have one, but it could have more than one, right? So uh, the basic thing to remember is main process, uh, less exposed to the user, much more difficult to secure. Basically, if you have a remote code execution here, you're done. Uh, and uh, the, but if this is more difficult to reach at the same time. Uh, and then uh, on the window, this is what is most exposed to the user, right? So Electron has a lot more security settings to to protect like the security uh, of this window because this is obviously the main attack surface, right? Where XSS is going to happen normally uh, and all this is going to be here, right? So what we're going to be uh, demonstrating today is the lack of context isolation, right? So when there, there's really no isolation between the render process and the HTML that the user has going on uh, on the on the screen, uh, and then uh, we are going to see like what what can happen with that, right? So, uh, so normally, uh, if there is uh, no context isolation, which I believe is is still the default in Electron, right? So when context isolation is set to false, then if the preload script, uh, which is the script that is executed before uh, opening the, the window itself, if you define, for example, window ABC and you set it to one to three, and then on index.html, you do alert uh, window ABC, you will see one, two, three, right? This is because there's no isolation between the Electron application itself and the HTML and JavaScript that the user is running. So this is uh, very bad as you're going to see today because this introduces some uh, attack opportunities, right? And then when context isolation is set to true, then this JavaScript on the preload script runs in a completely isolated uh, environment from this, right? So there's like kind of uh, two separate engines, right? So uh, the JavaScript running here is isolated from this JavaScript. So if you do window ABC and you set it to one, two, three, and then in here you do alert window ABC, you will see that this is undefined, right? Because there's isolation. 
So now the question, obviously, in everybody's mind is probably what can go wrong with this, right? What happens if we do, we do this? We have complex isolation set to full. So what happens? Can I ask? Sorry, but before what? we, <laughs> I don't mean to keep interrupting. I'm sorry. Uh, no, it's, it's so cool. So I, I am not too familiar with Electron. I'm very naive in this sense. Uh, I know the context isolation, okay, enabling it will help better security. D do you happen to know where or how that is set? Is it some other file? Is it some configuration for context isolation? Uh, yeah, so I have this like in the uh, full workshop. So let me see uh, if I go here. <laughs> I'm uh, oh, no, that's, <laughs> that's, that's fair enough, but give me a second and I'll just jump into here. So, so this is the place Gotcha. where you would set context isolation. So you have to look for new browser window mm. or, or browser window, just do a grab. If you have the source code of the application, just do a grab for browser window. And then one of the parameters to this browser window is going to be web preferences. Now, sometimes developers are going to define this somewhere else, but then eventually they will pass it either through a variable or a constant or whatever to browser window somehow, right? So browser window, just go for browser window and then go backwards like what settings are being passed to this. Uh, and then one of the settings is web preferences. So another thing could be to search for web preferences so, because mm -hmm. it has to be called that. And then there's two major security settings. So node integration uh, will uh, turn any XSS immediately into code execution. Whoa. So this is very bad and this, this is no longer the default, right? So this node, node integration is now set to false by default. But context isolation, which is a little bit less known, uh, this is uh, still the default is to set it to false, and this is bad because when a context isolation is set to false, you can basically uh, electron APIs and the preload script run in the same context. So an XSS vulnerability could allow an attacker to redefine app functionality using uh, prototype tampering. Back here to the slides, basically, this is what you can do, right? So when you have uh, when you don't have context isolation, right? So when context isolation is set to false, then what you can do is do, uh, for example, I'm going to redefine the index of function so that instead of doing what the index of function does in JavaScript, it's always going to return lit. So 1,337. Uh, and then regardless of, um, of what the code is doing, you can alter like the logic of the application and make the application something that the application didn't intend to do, right? So this will make more sense maybe when I do the demo mm. uh, because I will break it down like step by step because it's a little bit weird. But uh, but yeah, this is basically the idea, right? So what we can do is redefine, uh, in this case, we will be redefining the index of functions to always return lead. And this is going to allow us to bypass uh, a security check to be able to open uh, file URLs with a Java extension, which will result in code execution without warnings uh, in Windows, right? Because uh, lit is basically always going to be different than minus one. So the file URL will be accepted. But again, uh, this will make more sense now when I jump into the demo. So we're going to see an application. The application defines safe protocols, which are HTTP and HTTPS. So these are protocols. I mean, HTTP is not very safe. But uh, for the purposes of Electron, uh, it is a safe protocol in the sense that uh, it is safe to be open using shell open external. So what's going to happen is in Electron, when you call shell open external, what Electron does, it, it sends this uh, URL uh, to the operating system. So here we will be attacking several things, right? So what we are doing is Using the lack of context isolation, we will bypass this security check that will disenforces that uh, the the protocol is either HTTP or HTTPS, and if so, then it will open it on the browser, right? Because shell open external, if the URL is HTTP or HTTPS, will be open in the operating system browser, so this is safe, right? It's safe in terms of it will not be code execution, right? So we will be sending a user like a message like, "Hey, look at this," which is a file URL, which is dangerous using a network location, which is dangerous, <laughs> and a Java extension, which will result in code execution without warnings uh, in Windows. This is a well-known trick. Um, and then uh, the application will refuse to hold it. So send a message to the user like this. So we simulate this with, the, with this dummy app. And then the user receives a message, hey, look at this with the file URL. And when the user clicks on it, 
the application is correctly refusing to, to open the link because it should not open the link, right? Same, this link is unsafe, right? So it is correctly preventing this. And what we are going to do is to bypass this security check through uh, the lack of uh, isolation, right? So we're going to the payload script and this is the index of function. So what we can do to send the same message, hey, look at this. And this is a file URL uh, with the Java extension. And then using XSS, we can do image source X on error, uh, a wrapper type index of equal function uh, return lead. So now this check, which was doing that the index of function is different than minus one. So basically different than minus one means the protocol, uh, if it is different than minus one. So the protocols are defined here in the safe protocols, right? So if the protocol is HTTP, this will be position zero of the array. So index of is going to return zero. Uh, if the protocol is HTTPS, then this will be position one of the array, right? Because things in computers start with zero. So this is position zero, this is position one. So for HTTP, it will return zero. For HTTPS, it will return one. But for anything else, like file, gopher, FTP, whatever, uh, is going to return minus one. So this security check is saying, if it is different than minus one, then open it with shell open external, which normally would be the browser, and this would be fine. But what we're doing here is sending a file URL that because it has a Java extension, uh, it will be sent to Windows and then Windows sees, oh, this is a Java extension, so I should send this to Java. Uh, and then Java will show you no warnings and it will run the, the payload directly. So this is what's resulting in code execution without warnings. Now here we're using local host, but this could be like attacker.com or something. Right. So, so yeah, and then I'll break it in the console so that this makes more sense. So let's just maybe come to the demo. Uh, and this will make more sense. So let me just close this first. First, um, I have to uh, run the application. So this is called vulnerable tree. Yeah. And then you do npm start. So this starts the application. And here we have like the console to so that we can see what's going on. So now I'm going to uh, first uh, do this, uh, look at this and see how it works, right? And I'll just show the code again. And just send in the message. And then when I click on this, you can see that the tech is working. Is The application is refusing to let the user uh, open this link because it is really unsafe. You, know, you should not click on this. It says file URL with a Java extension. It's dangerous. It would be code execution, but the application is correctly popping this. So now if I go here to the preload script, we can see what the validation is doing, right? So safe protocols, HTTP and HTTPS. So I can just copy this from here just to simulate this in the console. I'm, I'm breaking it down. And let's see what the logic is, right? So I'm doing here safe protocol, HTTP and HTTPS. And now if I do this safe protocols index of, um, I do this with uh, HTTP instead of, uh, Doing protocol, so I'm just going to put here HTTP. You can see that this is position zero of the array, as I explained before. Now, if I do it with S, it is position one. But if I do file, now this is minus one because this doesn't exist in the array. So for anything that doesn't exist, for example, not here, <laughs> this is going to return minus one as well, right? So. The logic is if it is different than minus one, so it is HTTP or HTTPS, then open it in the browser, which is fine. And if not, then say this link is unsafe. So what we're going to do is we're going to redefine the index of function so that this security check is bypassed and then all the links are open in shell open external. So this way we will get the application to open the file URL with the Java extension directly inside of the application which will internally send this to Windows and then Windows will send this to Java and Java will show no warnings and then we will get code execution, right? So uh, the way to do this would be to send the same thing, uh, but now we are adding this access here that redefines the index of function, right? So we're doing image source X on error, a wrapper type index of function, return lead. So if I send this, you can see here the broken image. So we have uh, an access vulnerability that is redefining the index of function. So now if uh, I uh, close this and try it again, uh, let's see, maybe 
I'm just going to do it like this. Just copy it from here. Uh, so now if I do index of file, it's going to be lit. If I do index of HTTP, it's also lit. And if I do HTTP, it's also lit. It doesn't really matter what I do here. It's always lit, right? So, so now what happens is if I click on this, now instead of getting this error message, like this link is unsafe, now the, the this Java file is being executed and this is just demonstrating that uh, this is being uh, executed, right? So this is just uh, one of the exercises that um, uh, that we have in the workshop. And yeah, like, do you have like any questions uh, about this uh, before I jump back to the slides? Oh, you know, I always do. <laughs> no, 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 that was cool. Uh, I want to try and walk back through it in my mind just for my own clarification's sake. So the application has this message box where you can input anything and that will get rendered back out to you in the browser. And that is where yeah, the, well, the cross-site scripting this... bonus, right? Yeah, this is basically a simulation of a messaging application where would you normally be messaging another user? Gotcha. But to keep things simple, we're just messaging ourselves. Just cool. this this is like a simplification of the vulnerability found in real life, just because it's easier like to demonstrate and to play with. Uh, but in real life, you would be sending this message to another user, and then the other user gets accessed, and then with the accesses, you can redefine. Uh, the index of function and do all these uh, magic. So the danger of cross-site scripting in an Electron application is that it's already in JavaScript, like you're tampering with the real code of how the application works in that case, right? Uh, yeah, but this is because there is no context isolation, right? Mm. So this is because if I go here to main.js, context isolation is set to false. If I set this to true, uh, and I try the um, the same thing; it would not work, gotcha. right? Yeah, cool. because this is this is because it's running in the same context, and then we can do uh, that uh, that stuff. But if um, for so if context isolation, for example, was here was true, mm -hmm. and then I try to redefine the index of function, the index of function will be redefined in the security context of the HTML, but not will not be able to alter the preload script index the index of because this index of will be running in a different context right yeah so this is this is why uh long story short this is why context isolation <laughs> here should be true and the way right. that you're redefining that index of function, and it doesn't have to be index of, we're just using it for that that check. Yeah. Uh is that's prototype pollution, correct? Uh sort of climbing up and rearranging yeah, it's, yeah it's kind of it's kind of a, a prototype pollution in that you are redefining uh, the, the the function itself nice. so it's not prototype pollution in the in the traditional sense that you would say like the underscore underscore proto on a web application right. but it is kind of prototype pollution in terms of like you are redefining like the, how javascript functions work but this always is going to depend on what the preload script does right so in this case the preload script is using index of maybe in another case it would be using a, another javascript function and then you would be attacking this other javascript function and not index of right so here we're attacking index of just because this is the security check mm -hmm. where uh, that is using index of and this is why we're attacking this in particular but as i said uh, it's also possible to attack uh, Electron itself. So you could, if there is, if uh, context isolation is here is set to uh, false, like here, uh, another trick that you could do is send a, an IPC to Electron itself. Uh, and uh, this uh, normally requires a little bit of tuning because it depends a bit on the Electron version, but it's also possible to gain code execution uh, that way, just because it runs on the same context. Like basically there's, there's too many tricks. If if the security context in which the XSS runs is the same as the security context of the application code, then you can mess not just with the preload script but also with Electron itself, right? So, so this is really bad. <laughs> yeah. The preload.js uh, file is is normally, yeah. I guess, from the attacker's perspective a black box, right? If you're beating something up, trying to hey, take advantage of an application, you you don't know what is in preload.js or is there any way for you to maybe dig that out and, and uncover that? 
you would uh, you would normally know because uh, because of several things, right? So this is a desktop application, so all the code is on the client computer. Nice. So the attacker. So for example, you download the Slack application, so yeah. you can extract the application, and then like in the course, like we have like techniques to like reverse uh, electron apps in like many different ways in which they can be packaged, and basically you can extract it, and then the application is written in JavaScript. So the worst that can happen normally is that uh, the, the JavaScript application is maybe minified, but you can uh, prettify it. Nice. <laughs> uh, it won't be as pretty as the original with comments and so on, but it will at least be somewhat readable. Uh, yeah, and then from there uh, you will look. Uh, so normally the process is something uh, something like this, right? So this vulnerable three, uh, you would uh, reverse the application and then eventually you will see something like this. And then what you do is normally you go to package.json, you open this with some editor, uh, and here you would see, okay, this is main, is the main entry point. So the main entry point is main.js. So that will take you to main.js, which I already have open here. And then this uh, in here, you just look at this and this will define on the web preferences, the preload script, and it will say, what is the path of the preload script, right? So the preload script might not be preload.js, it might be something else.js, right? But the, the process is, is always like that. So package.json, what is the main entry point? And then from there, you start reading the code, maybe main.js, loads all the files, uh, but eventually uh, there will be like some browser window because all desktop applications are going to have some window somewhere <laughs> that is going to have some web preferences and the web preferences uh, is going to have like some preload script and this will tell you the path of this and then from there you just open the preload JS and start reading it maybe you have to beautify it but but yeah, it doesn't matter. Uh, in fact, in the course we use uh, Slack, Discord, uh, Skype, <laughs> BitGarden wow like the real applications uh, during the course and we do like all the reversing and you know different exercises like demonstrating different things so yeah that is awesome that is super cool yeah. um, so that tracker uh, this is a bit similar with mobile applications that are written with apache cordova and so on like this uh, is basically javascript on the client uh, sometimes in some pen tests, I've seen uh, applications, uh, mobile applications written in JavaScript where the JavaScript code was encrypted. So the application mm -hmm. was uh, decrypting the JavaScript code on runtime. So the code was like minified and encrypted, but you can always like hook and uh, and get the, the real JavaScript from memory and so on. Basically, it's, it's game over, right? Because the attacker has uh, can download the application, can reverse it, has access to memory, to this, to everything. And it's just a matter of time and maybe skill, uh, but uh, you know the attacker has everything they need to to reverse this and find the vulnerabilities. Maybe you can raise the bar, you can make it more difficult. Uh, you can try what banks normally do is to put as much stuff as possible in binaries, hmm. because that raises the bar from like the general uh, people that can read JavaScript to people that can mess with assembly. So that's going to raise the bar a little bit. So you can make it tougher, but you cannot uh, really stop it because attacker has access to everything right wow client side on the desktop that's that's crazy cool yeah. so i know this was one of the labs in that upcoming training course uh in the workshop are there others or can you kind of sprinkle and hint towards some of the other really cool stuff that we're doing or do you kind of do you feel like hey you've already mentioned a good few of them <laughs> well i can maybe uh go to uh to the real so this is like uh real workshop so in the real workshop like the full like one hour workshop first we cover like some essential techniques to audit electron applications so how to find vulnerabilities and dependencies using npm audit and so on nice. then we explain like these web preferences like so node integration through bad code isolation false bad uh, why and like there's like some vulnerabilities there's like negativities uh tool for uh, finding problems in electron applications so we demonstrate that as well then there's like a demo of this then there's like an intro like how to get code execution in electron applications so there's like another vulnerable application for this uh, this is another trick in electron applications you can use this keystroke combination it can be uh, blocked uh, i mean developers have an option to uh, 
to override this, but most of the time they don't. So most of the time, like if you open Skype or other applications, you can control shift I, or if you have a Mac command shift I, and this will open the developer tools. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you can try and see, like, do they have content security policy uh, and so on and all that stuff, right? So. So yeah, in the workshop, like we have like more examples, like uh, first, like with some uh, alert one and so on to demonstrate that we have some XSS, then some ways to gain code execution. Ooh. So there's like some demos about this. Then there's also mitigation, right? So here, this is interesting because we do like different layers, like disabling node integration, uh, using CSP. Uh, and then there's also like the problem of uh, what uh, what well, I mean, the, the proper way would be to fix the the, the XSS itself, right? So instead of using inner HTML, for example, using content, but this is the proper way to fix it. But in some cases, developers might need uh, HTML for some uh, reason. <laughs> uh, in that case, uh, you could use like some tool, some library like on Purify, where you would sanitize the uh, the HTML, right? So we also show an example. Uh, about sanitizing this, a better way to use Don Purify would be to use a white list of tags. It would be even stronger because it will sanitize the HTML and also ensure that you only allow, for example, bold, underline, and something like that, and not like script image <laughs> and other uh, more dangerous uh, things, right? So that's one of the things. So there's like a couple of demos. Then there's the preload scripts, which is the demo I did today. And then uh, there's also another very cool one. Is, um, the execution using IPCs, right? Because an electron, so there's the main process and the render process that I showed before here. Yeah. Right? So they can send uh, an IPC to each other, right? So I can, the render process can send a message to the main process. So in the full workshop. Cool. Let's, let's like, save uh, that one because I think that's going to be way too cool. And I, and I hope people okay. are going to be super interested <laughs> in it. <laughs> yeah, this, this, this one is very cool and it ends with a uh, like reverse shell and everything. So Ooh. that's yeah, yeah, that was that's the you know the best for for last. <laughs> no, I think so, that's fantastic. Yeah, so with that, uh, that'll be uh, you know like a, a teaser about what we cover in the workshop uh, in case anybody is interested. And this one, I think, will be uh, in the third of March. We will maybe put it in the description. Uh, and yeah, next week we have like another workshop about mobile security uh, with deep links uh, and XSS, which is also pretty cool because it's about, uh, you know, what you can do with deep links, uh, impersonating users and doing some actions on their behalf, like following arbitrary users, making phone calls. Uh, and then there's also uh, this scenario of uh, data exfiltration on mobile applications using XSS, right? So using an XSS vulnerability that allows you to, uh, you know, read data from the file system and send it to an attacker. Wow. Well, hey, I mean, all of that sounds incredible. Uh, I, for one, am super excited now. I want to go check out uh, what you got going on on the February 24th and the one for March 3rd to see more of this Electron, that, that last demo. <laughs> Pretty cool cliffhanger, getting the reverse shell uh, with IPC. But thank you. Thank you, Aaron. This has been uh, fantastic. Um, are there any other links or any other folks where people can find you, see what you're up to? Uh, I know we're, hey, locked in for February 24th and March 3rd, but uh, what else, my friend? <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, all the free workshops is just 70 secure comes last free. Uh, and then 70 secure comes last training is whenever we are teaching next. So that is kind of the calendar, like the free workshops every month in case somebody wants to attend live. Uh, as well as if we're delivering training at 44Con, NorthSec, or maybe Black Hat, we will see. It's still not, uh, still not known if we will be at Black Hat again this year. The last two years we were at Black Hat. So, so yeah. Uh, cool. That is basically the story. Seven Secure Comes Last Free or Seven Secure Com uh, Last Training would be like the two main pages to, to check, I think. Well, hey, I will include uh, some links for those fantastic resources here in the description of the video. And uh, I hope for anyone tuning in and watching this, uh, that was just as cool and exciting as I thought it was. Uh, I'm excited to see more. So thank awesome. you again and again. Abram, uh, we'll keep in touch and uh, I'll see you for the next one. Sure. Thank you. With the, 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 the,